Welcome everybody to the Public Infrastructure, Environment and Sustainability Committee, otherwise known as PIES, for May 23rd. And I need approval of the minutes. So, so moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great, thank you. First up, we're gonna have the consultant contract for South Logan, transit-oriented development, we call it TOD for short. And um, Mr. Gardner, you're gonna be presenting today. Thank you. Uh, there's actually nothing to present. We just didn't get this in before the, uh, the consent agenda deadline. So you've already heard about the project. This is just the consultant contract. Um, if you have any questions, we can take them. Marin's also here. She's the project manager. She's just remote, so I decided to come in. Great. Any questions? Council, Council do you have questions? Well, we've been over this a number of times. It's in okay. District 1's neighborhood. It's a fabulous pilot. Thank you for working on it. Yeah. And thank you for giving us five minutes back on our time. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, Inga, we're going to do US 195 Transportation Study Adoption Resolution. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I have a presentation. I don't know if you want to see it or if you still remember everything that I talked about last time, but this is just um, adopting the US 195 study. I'm going to ask council to, okay, we've got a no, shake head no. Anybody else want to see it? Council President? You got off light, Inga. Okay. All right. Questions for Inga? Great. Keep her up here for five minutes and ask <laughs> I'm just now giving you more time minutes. back. Do you know any jokes? I don't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. And the 2022 amendments to the Retail Water Service Boundary, Eldon. Welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'll see if I can bring up the slide we, here and show you the. Eldon, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> thank you. See if I can bring them up here. Okay. We have four areas around town here that would like to actually modify our retail water boundary. And the first one is actually out here on the northwest part of town, the Indian Trail area. And the one thing I would like to highlight This is a property in purple on here. And the first thing we do when we evaluate the sites is we look at our duty to provide water service. And we have four criteria we look at. One of them is water available in a reasonably and timely manner. And we do have water mains in this area. You can kind of see on the east side and then also coming in from the north. So they would approximately have about a block's extension to actually provide water service to the sites. Do we have sufficient water rights? Yes, we do on that. Here's the one that's kind of the kicker that we have right now, and that's sufficient capacity to serve. And what we're looking at there all around the city is the first thing we look at is do we have uh, projects in our six-year capital improvement program to actually provide water service to actually move these projects into the retail water boundary. We do have in all four of these that we're talking about. We have projects in the program that would actually construct any needed improvements we have within the six-year timeline. So from a concurrency perspective, we would recommend on all four of these that they be included in the boundary because we have projects that can serve them. It just not may happen as quickly as they'd like. I mean, if somebody wants to come in and say next year of some sort, we may not have water available until we actually have that improvement in place. So we, we will evaluate each project as they come to the door once they get put in the boundary to actually see what type of stipulations we may have as far as water service at that point in time. But that's what I wanted to stress to everybody here right now. 
And then the fourth thing we look at is it's consistent with our requirements of local plans and regulations. All four of these are in the urban growth boundary. So they do meet all that criteria. So this first one here is basically a 11 acre total project. They'd like to subdivide that thing into, I think somewhere around 86 lots, somewhere of that nature. It is zoned low density residential in the county, which means you can develop one to six units per acre on there. And there again, we do have some projects out there. We got really high velocities and some lines out there. So we need a transmission main extension to actually provide some additional capacity along with some pressure reducing valves. And we do have those scheduled to actually happen within a fairly short timeline to accommodate this project. Uh, so is there any questions on that one? Eldon, my glasses aren't as good as they used to be. <laughs> I'm not quite getting exactly the location of this property we're talking about, so. Okay, here's Nine Mile Road oh, okay. on the east, then Seven Mile takes off, and so this is several hundred feet down the road west of Nine Mile Road, in uh, just south of the Sundance Golf Course, okay. Okay, in that you. vicinity out there. Right, That's where we're you. talking about. Any other questions on that one? I have a question, Eldon. Yeah. Um, it, and because you've been around so long, you'll know the answer to this. What other infrastructure would need to happen to, um, so in other words, would we need sewer out there? Do the roads need improvement? What else needs to happen out there so we don't have some unintended consequences? Sewer is probably the biggest one right now. We're, we've been working on that for a couple of years and we're still working on actually getting the pump station with some force mains sited in that area out there to be able to pump effluent back to the city. So that's probably the biggest thing we got going right at the moment out there. And the county's working on roads out there as far as Nine Mile too. And I think you're potentially looking at a roundabout in the vicinity of Seven Mile and Nine Mile. So there's things they're looking at in that area out there also. Yeah. Just wondering, Eldon, could you just share as you go through these four when when the applications were submitted for each one approximately? Yeah, they were all pretty much I don't have them right in front of me, but they're in the fall of this last year. All four of them? One of them was earlier. One of them was in, we just missed out in the deadline last year in April. That was the one from Dr. DeWood. Right. But the rest of them came in after that timeline. After we had the hearing in June of last year, we received three new ones in that timeline for, to make the four that we have. Well, and that, that's the one I wanted to point out is, is that one, 136 single family, I believe, out on the West Plains. Yes. And I think if we hadn't punted on that in November, we'd have sticks in the ground right now, and the housing would have been a lot more affordable uh, considering the increases in material costs, labor costs, et cetera, in that time. So we've essentially allowed those housing costs to skyrocket because we punted rather than allowing them to move forward. We would have been taking a look at that capacity scenario, but certainly we'd have moved ahead as far as putting it in the boundary and going through the process that much quicker. A question? Yeah. Eldon, while you're on that, I'm, I know on the West Plains we're limited because of project under I-90, the tower and stuff like that. Is the one that Councilmember Cathcart, is that limited by those restrictions that? Yes. That's so we one couldn't be doing those right now. That's what, well, to actually put them in the boundary, like I say, we feel like we have kind of a duty because we do have projects in our six year program that would actually provide the needed facilities to serve all of these that I'm bringing forth on here. So everybody today, even if you're in that retail water boundary, we're gonna have to take a look at you from a capacity perspective. But that's what I mean, the West Plains, we're not approving any water hookups for a while out there and for the next two years. Other than ones we've already committed to. Yeah. So yes. they can't, we, they can't, they couldn't be built. Well, they couldn't get a certificate of occupancy and put it that way. Yeah, because one of the things we are looking at, which Catherine is going to be talking about too, is somebody could actually go out there and build a project and actually build the structures and they're using some on-site facilities where they have tanker trucks for water. So you have fire protection during construction. You can do things like that to keep things moving. You just couldn't actually physically hook up to our system with potable water until you have the water system available to you. So there, there, there may be some misunderstandings by the developer because they are planning on a full speed ahead as soon as the city approves this. So is it your understanding that they're barred from moving forward uh, pending some WashDOT decision? Well, we're looking at everything going on out there, but right now with what I'm doing, by put, trying to put them in the boundary on their way, then applications come in from the county that we have to look at every one of them to see what they're doing and when they want to do it, you know, to see what we really have available to them that point in time. But this is the first step in getting them put in that boundary. 
So if, if there are prohibitions, why would we even consider, why are we even considering this if we're not going to allow them to hook up to water? Well, I think there are, like, people can choose to actually see if they can move ahead and actually get projects moving and actually build right up to the point of getting certificate of occupancy with structures, they would have the ability to actually move ahead and then, and then once our system is available to hook up, but you can at least keep the process moving forward okay. instead of just being totally stopped. Okay. Did, Marlene, did you want to say? No, that was essentially what I was going to say, which is, you know, it's okay to add them to the retail um, boundary but we still get to decide you know, when we're ready to serve them. So this doesn't guarantee them water at a specific time, it just allows them to be within our retail water service area. And is part of the decision making on that uh, consideration of our housing crisis? Well, part of the consideration, that Catherine's gonna go through the whole thing around the West Plains and when we have water availability there and what kind of things are already in the pipeline for approvals. So we're gonna, that's next. Okay. Um, so I think you'll get a clearer understanding of where we're at as far okay. as that goes. That's helpful, thank you. And it would be nice, go ahead. And when we talk about that, it would be nice to know how much is affordable housing, right? I mean. How are you defining affordable? Well, not at eight, not $600,000 homes that low-income people can't afford. I mean, I'm thinking, I would just like that definition or that uh, distinction. We've got somebody out there trying to build affordable housing is one thing, um, because that's what we're really in need of right now. But the more we delay, the more expensive that housing gets. So just a reminder on that. Gotcha. Okay. Elton, you want to continue? All right. The second site we have is out in the West Plains. It's in the vicinity south of I-90. It's at 57th and Dowdy Road out there in the West Plains. This one does have water mains, as you can see, right adjacent to it in the blue there and also right at the intersection of Dowdy and 57th. So it has the ability to be served directly once we have the capacity available to serve it on here. So on this one here is actually zoned light industrial today and they wanna, they're want they going through the comp plan amendment to actually change it to low density residential in there. So it's twofold here. They're trying to actually get the ability to change it to a residential zoning. And then there again, assuming if these get put in the retail boundary, it's in the UGA in there, why the first thing would have to happen is the county submits an application to us with whatever type of an application, whether it's a plat, land use or whatever, then we have a chance to review it put any type of comments to it that we can see to actually make it, make it compatible with our water facilities. But it is a 11 acre total parcel and you got three parcels there and they're trying to change it to low density residential from, and that's a separate process going on as we speak. Any questions on that one? Questions? Nope. This third one out here, is next to Silver Road, and there again, I think that's Holly on the west side. It's a very similar area to the, the other one, just down the road from it. This one is an existing 15.7 acre parcel in here, and it's zoned for medium family, medium density residential on this one, not low density, which means you could put from seven to 15 units per acre on it instead of one to six, which is low density residential. So. That's their application. They would like to move forward and actually change it. To, or it's in the medium density residential zoning today. So they're looking to develop with the same criteria as the rest of them. We just have to evaluate the application if it came through and put whatever type of comments to it to make it compatible with our water system. Any questions on that one? This last one is the one we were trying to do last fall. This one with Dr. DeWood out here. This is Hallett Road and uh, Thomas Mallon for reference on the west over here. So again, it's on the south part of I-90 out in the West Plains, not too far away from those other two on here. And he's looking to basically develop uh, low density residential housing, one, unit, one to six units per acre. And this is roughly 30 acres total, 10 acres on one parcel, 20 on the other. So he would want to come in and develop, and he'll be in the same boat as the rest of them as far as commenting on, you know, what we have available from a water capacity perspective. So any questions on that one? All of these, all four of them, again, are in the urban growth boundary, and they're all in our future water service boundary, just not in the retail water service boundary. 
And tell the group what you told me about timing. When will this come forward for a vote? Probably sometime next month is when I would come forward with the hearing. Okay. That's what I'm looking doing anyway. Do we have any idea how many units in total these four uh, would bring for housing in the city or in the area? This one here, like I say, was uh, somewhere around 136, as I recall the original application. And the rest of them, if we figured, uh, you know, like 11 units per, or uh, 11 acres on two of them, 22 times, say, six, so that's another 130. So you're, you're talking somewhere between three and 400 acre, uh, units out of this total batch of these four if they fully developed them. Any other questions? Questions, anyone? No, nope. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate your time. So Marlene, you and Catherine next on the amendments to the Airway Heights Emergency Water Agreement. Catherine's going to take us through this. So it's, this is kind of a combined presentation on specifically on the Airway Heights water request and there we'll proceed with an amendment to their current um, water service agreement, but also to explain how this impacts water service delivery in the two pressure zones that we serve Airway Heights from. So the Plains pressure zone and the um, SIA, Spokane International Airport zone. So um, Catherine's going to take you through this and if we have, you know, we're open to all kinds of questions on this. So. Uh, this work for all the presentation purposes. All right, I'll let you do the magic there. So as Marlene indicated, uh, we have a um, contract in front of us, council coming up next month for Airway Heights. They have the water, um, they have the emergency water uh, in place now and they are coming in for their last one year water extension on the original contract. During the conversations with Airway Heights, they have asked for an amendment to this existing contract that will technically end after this last one year extension. They've asked for a few things, one of them being an extension for three one year extensions, so three more years of one year extensions. And more importantly, or as importantly uh, for the city of Spokane, they've also asked for additional water. And so we have a water question in front of us in Airway Heights. And as uh, you were kind of hearing out through, through Eldon, we also have a timing co consideration in Airway Heights. We have a tank that is needed uh, to service not only existing, if you drive out there today and look at what's out there, but you also have a, majority, a, a list of projects that are in the process and being approved that the city of Spokane also has a commitment to serve water to that you don't see out there today. That you'll be seen built over the next, we're gonna say two years while we're waiting for this tank. And so we have an outside request from Airway Heights for water, as well as the city of Spokane's need to see that we're servicing within our own city boundaries at the same time. Switching over to here. So that's in generally what we're talking about for a presentation today. So I do want to build some awareness around the temporary challenges we have with our water system right now. Again, getting that first tank on board. There's some other facilities that also need to come on. But once that tank is, that gives us that first opportunity to, to uh, talk about extending uh, water. Uh, the overview of existing and proposed. Again, we've got a lot of existing out there today. We also have a lot in our pipeline for the city of Spokane. And again, this external a request from Airway Heights. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that potential with Airway Heights and then some potential uh, solutions. And again, timing is, is the question. So this is really just for, for council. Obviously, uh, Airway Heights area, we have the PDA boundary, which crosses over both all of the city boundary plus uh, some of the county that we are certainly a part of and in, in communication and coordination with. Uh, most of that area up there is a light industrial. We do have residential, of course, and other types of land, uh, land use. We're trying to balance out. The water system is served in that area by two separate pressure zones. At the top of the page here is what we call the SIA pressure zone, as well as the West Plains pressure zone. Between the two of those, you can sort of see it here in the hash marks here. This is the SIA pressure zone in general, and the West Plains is more to the west area. 
But between those two zones, we are able to service uh, folks out there today. And again, we're looking at our capacity in this interim to see what we can serve uh, between now and when that tank is operational. So the request again for Airy Heights that came in, they would like to use their last one year extension from the original contract. And then the second request is an amendment that three additional one year extensions plus that increase in volume. And that got our attention. We've been talking to them, uh, uh, well, dating back to last year when they asked for the one year extension, they started making some overtures about water and we were giving them overtures back that we need to talk about that. That's gonna come with a bigger conversation than just a simple yes. Um, so what we took their request and we went through a process just to understand our existing conditions. So we looked at all of our existing demands. Again, this is what you can drive out there and see being used today. We also were, reviewed all of our available storage and plus exactly how we're utilizing it, right? When you operate a system, you can operate at different elevations within a tank that you can allow uh, more pressures to happen. So we wanted to make sure when we modeled it that we were modeling exactly how they were operating it, which also meant we just didn't take a pump spec of what pumps can pump over you know, the last 20 years or how long they've been in service. We actually have field tested pump data. So we are again are reflecting as much of reality that we can into our model to make sure that when we talk about future flows that we in fact are modeling correctly. So I'm gonna get back to existing. So even existing, we ran our fire flow scenarios which are required to make sure obviously in an in a emergency situation, we obviously have plenty of water uh, to deal with that uh, required uh, emergency coverage. We also looked at peak demands. Again, this is just in existing scenarios. And so what our modeling was showing in existing scenarios is a combination of things. Our operators are actually uh, uh, operating that tank, those tank levels to the highest possible level, which every tank has an uh, emergency overflow to allow any kind of release of water to be safely handled. And so we're actually operating right at that level, which means we are maximizing their ability to keep as much water in those tanks as possible. We also know from pump data, pumping uh, logs, that we're pumping quite a bit in terms of our hours to catch up with the system. This is the scenario of that peak summer demand time period, right? So this isn't all year round. This is when you need it the most, obviously your hottest summer conditions, as well as your most use in terms of where people are using water. And so in our existing condition, we got pumps that are, while they are keeping up, they are struggling in the sense that they're running long, long hours to make sure that we are keeping up, uh, you know, for that next cycle, that day use and all those kind of things. We know our operators are maximizing uh, their use. They're maximizing their use up to, you know, getting, making sure we're keeping 30. Keep in mind, we're, we got 45 PSI as our standard. So we're, you know, uh, we're, 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 well, we're not exactly ideal. We are certainly servicing in terms of our health department requires a 20 PSI. We have better standards in terms of making sure we've got a good quality standard for our customers. In this scenario, we're just making it work while we get through this scenario. Um, but what we found was not only are our pumps struggling a little bit to keep up, when we talk about figuring out fire flow, and I'm going to go back to this image if I can, uh, 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 here, these are connected, these two systems in terms of the SIA and the West Plains, and what we found in existing conditions, our SIA isn't keeping up with our fire flow scenario, which means we have to backflow water from this upper or higher because it's all gravity fed. Uh, system. So we pump all the way up to the top, if you will, elevation, and we can backflow down. And so in, in existing today conditions, uh, if, if we run into that, again, calculated out fire need that we have to cover, we would actually fly our flow water back from the, the West Plains into the SI to cover it. So we're, we're good. We're making it work in terms of uh, waiting for that new tank to come in. So now the question is adding more use to that system, which means, again, your pumps are gonna have to work even harder. You can't work more than 24 hours in a day. So obviously everything has a maximum that we're watching very closely. You also don't have all the water stored in that upper tank up here in terms of that West Plains. So there is a maximum that we can backflow and still cover the West Plains fire flow as well as the SIA fire flow. So those are all the factors that we are watching very closely, again, as that tank is being built. So when we looked at existing and we looked at the request that came in from Airway Heights, um, what we came down to, uh, hold on, let me finish too. We also looked at our own, right, in terms of what we have coming on. So we have a request for new water. We also have our own internal requests going on. 
I've got about 35 plus projects that we're working with Eldon's group on in terms of really understanding where they are in the process, in terms of where we're, uh, commitments are and that we can verify. Because obviously, like I said, all of our maxes that we, we know we can't exceed, we can't make more water up there, we can't pump more than 24 hours a day, those kind of things. Uh, we want to make sure we really understand what we are going to approve and make sure that those approvals can be met for our requirements. And then anything after that, it's still a yes, it's just a timing in terms of that new tank coming online and being operational. And so that window of time is what we're looking at in terms of understanding uh, what, we, what we need to, 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 um, to bridge. And then you heard Eldon talk about there is that potential if a developer or a development wants to bring in water tanks and to cover their own fire flow during construction. They could build out and use that time between now and when that tank is operational. And that window there could be covered with that water tank where that fire flow is not dependent on our system. And then it would just be a CFO and an operational of that tank coming online. That's what we'd be uh, uh, looking very, again, very closely at. So our initial analysis does show our ability to maintain within standards and the Department of Health Manual, uh, all the calculations we do in the background, is degraded without that tank being there. So we will have this window, again, that we are watching very closely. We're still analyzing to understand what's in our own door. And because of that, because of our existing condition, because of that outside request from Airway Heights, and because of our own needs that we're trying to cover, we do recommend at this point that uh, uh, we don't give any more water out if you will, to airway heights, because we're, we really need to focus on making sure we're covering what we have. So how are we covering what we have? And as Eldon mentioned, or, or Marlene mentioned too, we, we have projects in the program. There's no question about it. These are projects um, that are over $30 million that we have listed the first three ones, uh, three, that uh, number tank three is the one I'm talking about that needs to come online and be operational. That's our first uh, significant uh, ability to, to, again, uh, put more water out there capacity-wise. In the background, on a lower um, pressure zone, but also important to get more water out physically to that general area is our Thorpe, Thorpe Reservoir number two. And that's scheduled for the 2024-25. And as you see, I'll be back up to SIA tank number three, that's 24 uh, year that we're looking at for that to be operational. Another significant one for West Plains and SIA specifically is that I-90 crossing under, uh, under I-90 physically. Uh, that is funded. That's in the books. We are, should be hopefully going out to bid late this year, again, operational in 2024. The piece that's missing and the one that I'm highlighting is that Plains Booster. That's a project we do not have funded right now. Uh, it is a six to seven million dollar project. Uh, this is a project that uh, would be facilitating any requests from Airway Heights. And certainly uh, I've been working pretty closely with uh, Todd Coleman from the West Plains PDA. He also understands this is a significant booster for, for their developments as well. I, I had heard just, just a mention about a week ago that the county is looking at some water investments in the West Plains. Do you know is it related to any of this or is that completely separate? You know, I know they're talking about some investments in a sewer lift station. Okay. Uh, doing, dealing with sewer. Um, and they're working again with Todd Coleman and the PDA around that conversation, but that's the only one I'm that's familiar cool. with. Okay. And I don't believe they have um, a water purveyor status in terms of uh, the county itself. Any questions on our projects we have in, in the pipeline? Did I hear you say that you're recommending us not approving more water for the West? Just the additional Airway request Heights? for water until that tank comes online. Gotcha. So, so this keeping is the it at that 1400. Question. Excuse me? Keeping it at that 1400 until this is done? Exactly. Exactly. That's the emergency water they have under a temporary contract with us. That's the one that's up. Uh, for renegotiation next year, if you will, in terms of it times out. And but Catherine, why. we give them additional water and a different contract. Right. And I'm making the distinction yeah. here yeah, between yeah. the emergency water, which yes. is 1400 GPM. We've yeah. had a standing agreement with Airway Heights. We've been a long-term partner with Airway Heights for, for many years, and fit not decades here, for 30 years or so. Uh, that's about a 1500 gallons per minute. We've had that on the books for, for many, many years. So they've always used that to help with their peak or emergency uh, scenarios. But obviously, the city of Spokane stepped in uh, when they had the PFOS issue, and no, no fault to anyone's in terms of Airway Heights. Uh, it made total sense for the city of Spokane to step in and help with that 1400. But this is a, on top of the 1400 requests that I'm talking about that they've come to us for a request on. Go ahead. So we could still 
um, approve their request to extend that, mm -hmm. but it would still be at the 1400 They wouldn't get right. the additional. Right, and I've got, okay. a, I've got a slide for that okay. in terms of going through what we would recommend based on what they've asked Perfect. for. Okay. Go ahead, Councilmember Cathcart, then I need to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, just on that, I, it, I haven't had a chance to, to meet with Albert yet and talk about this. So from your, what's your understanding of why they need the additional uh, pumpage out there? Are they, are they, is it insufficient right now? Is that the issue? Or is there something else that they're trying to accomplish that they need the added uh, water? Well, I think like every community, I think everyone's getting the pressure of uh, an increased development pressures. So uh, they certainly uh, would like to, to have more water for, for development for themselves as well. But when, when we met with him, he said that if they didn't have the water pollution issue, they just would have used more of their water for that. But now that they can't use their water, um, they literally don't, people want to come to them for building permits and they can't approve them they, because we, they can't get the water. So, so it's, I would just say it's normal growth. It's nothing extraordinary. Okay. Yeah. So before we go on, let's, um, Catherine, I have a question. If we want to speak, please go through me so we're not trying to speak at once. Catherine, who pays for the infrastructure? That's, uh, that's the bigger question we're, we're, we would like to have with Airy Heights. Um, while it's been a temporary, understand that very first year after it was first discovered, we had no contract and we certainly stepped in and served them for that first year without any kind of contract. And then we stepped in and had a contract after that first year for five additional years. And now um, they're asking for three more one-year additions. In our conversations uh, with them, they, they don't have a crystal ball just like we don't. There's a lot of uh, milestones that they have to reach in terms of getting through their process uh, to, to cite uh, if that's what they ultimately end up doing uh, a well. And so it's really an undetermined amount of time, which is putting a lot of financial pressure on, on our system because they're taking up uh, between their original 1500 plus the 1400 for example on that west plains booster that's about 37 percent of that booster station would be taken up by just airway heights and that's again 37 percent of six to seven million dollars it becomes real money for for the city of spokane to try to understand how we're going to accomplish this and so it's very difficult in a water system that is all connected just to just to add on a quick part because there's nothing quick about building a new facility, especially in this day with sourcing the material, labor, and everything else that we're up against. And so it's very methodical that we need to be talking about what their full long-term needs are so we can understand and build in and, and plan for it. Because again, it, it just is not something we can, we, we certainly could step in and turn it on for them, but I'll, I've got some other slides to translate what that has meant for the city of Spokane. And isn't it true that they do have a charcoal filter system that they can use during the summer? Summertime only. It's not yeah. insulated at this point. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before I move on? So, yes, in conclusion, that additional capacity is not available right now for Airway Heights uh, until that number three tank, that SIA tank, comes in. And again, as I mentioned before, it's not just the only capacity. We, we are full capacity in that area to get through, I would say, uh, the, you know, not, not a 50 year long term thing. We have more sizing of pipes to upsize and some more facilities that we need to finish our work in terms of that full 20 year modeling in terms of what we need ultimately. But once we get SIA 3, that crossing and planes, we will be in a much better position to have a much uh, uh, more in depth conversation about, about that water capacity with airway heights. Um, so our response that we're recommending back to their request is we do recommend approving that last one year extension from the existing contract. We also recommend with conditions, if they were to get three additional one year extension, that it comes with a couple of caveats here. We, we do need some investment from Airway Heights and a proportional share of that West Plains booster. Uh, at, a, at a minimum. Now we've talked with them um, um, a bit here about kind of what their future needs are and they're still you know, working through their uh, analysis uh, as well. But ultimately, any kind of needs, we've asked for some dollars to help us analyze. We're in the middle of our 20 year. This is a perfect opportunity. We have all the consultants in place. We're looking at 20 year needs. We can add their need request into our analysis so we can get back a full 360 
picture of, of what that would look like. We can run scenarios if they you know, happen to be able to get more filters on, uh, but they actually want more water than their, than their wells can produce. Whatever that looks like, we can run scenarios and then we can talk through again, proportionate share of ultimately what they're asking for. But it's very difficult for us in this time just to have um, you know, a, a call on a Monday asking for water by Thursday kind of a thing. We, we really do have to get more facilities out there. Do you and have a question, cover our own. Yeah, just, just for clarification, functionally, do we just simply bill the city of Airway Heights for the amount of water, or do we treat their users like we do our rate payers and we send them individual bills? So right now, they, it's an inter-tie inter agreement that we have with them, and we have a, a, a inter-tie charge just like all of our inter-ties. So it just depends on the amount of water they're using. They're getting charged based on the inter-tie fee. And is that based on uh, what a non-resident pays for water? No, it's not an outside rate. It is not an inside rate. It's about, it's between the two. It's not exactly, you know, between the two, but it's between those two rates is an inner tie rate. So they are not paying outside customer rates and they are not paying inside customer rates. So, so can we always just change the rates like that with depending on where we're providing the water? This has been established for quite a while, our inner tie rates, so it's not a changing item that well, doesn't but, go But what I mean process. is we, can, we could have an inner tie with any, diff, any community or neighborhood or area outside the city and provide a different rate. No, no right we now have, they're all the same. We'll it's in the right. SMC. So you have a, a wholesale purveyor rate in the SMC that when we go through rate changes, that's included in, that, in those changes. So typically it's gone up at the same rate as the rest of our rates, but okay. it, it is its own rate and it's in the SMC. So we have to go through a council process to change it and all the inner ties are tied back to that rate in the SMC. Okay. Council President. I, I was just clarifying, because it's, a, it's essentially a wholesale rate to the city and then they charge whatever they want to their rate payers. I'm sure they do, correct. Please continue. Sure, so the first two bullets are really about the contract, obviously finishing out the existing and uh, caveats to extending. The last bullet is truly saying we're gonna have some time between now and when that tank is operational. We receive those dollars that we can put right to work uh, with our consultant work, use that time uh, to fully understand uh, any additional needs that would turn into any proportionate share. And then again, as soon as that tank is operational, we'll fully understand what their request is of our brand new tank that we can talk about, as well as, again, uh, any, any other facilities that uh, they would be potentially participating in. Go ahead. Thank you, Council Member So with tank number three coming online, and when that was designed, based on the growth that is continuing to happen out there, has there been another analysis that tank number three uh, needs to be larger capacity than what's designed already? Well, that's, oh, so how long will that stand sure. us in good stead for sure. future So we, we don't know the answer from Airy Heights yet. So it could be nothing. It could still be, they still need temporary. And we still need facilities. So it's not like a... Oh, uh, like a road where, where it'd be good to have a left turn lane, but you can live without a left turn lane, right? In a water system, y you can't have that opportunity. You, you need the tank or you don't have a tank. You don't have anything in between in, in terms of when someone needs, needs water. And so when we talk about finally getting to where Airway Heights, you know, what, what their final formal request is, that will inform us how much of in all of our capacities that they would like to participate in. And I was just, as that area continues to grow, what data or metrics will we be using if that tank, how long that tank will meet capacity right, for right. that growth before sure. we're back again? If it's, if it's a little bit, it's not going to be a big deal. Right. If it's half so, the okay. tank size, it's going to be a big deal, yeah. right? In, right, in terms of that. And that will then spur other conversations of other facilities that will be needed in a sooner timeline because of those requests. So it will be, again, kind of scenario-based, understand if this happens, then that would be the result. And then we would, again, come out to a kind of a final understanding of, of what the request is and what those outcomes are. So um, kind of doing a couple of slides of summation just to kind of pull this all together. Um, obviously, we never planned to give 1,400 gallons per minute to another community. You know, it's just not something that you would have seen coming in that regard. We certainly have intertie agreements for temporary emergencies, but this has been longer than, than temporary in terms of a week down because of an, a coli thing or, you know, whatever they had to flush their system out with. 
Um, when, when you translate that into what those impacts were for the city of Spokane, it effectively was taking about a year and a half of our growth capacity and, and, and giving it to, to Airway Heights in terms of the ability for us to have given to development either through platting or through um, um, commercial development permits. And so that's just kind of part of the part of what happened here in terms of that 1,400 gallons per minute. Go ahead. Just for clarification then, so a year and a half, but you're saying that we can't approve uh, development out there until there's more water accessible. So did we only have a year and a half of, of growth available out there? No, since we gave them that water, we've been obviously working on development in plats for the last four or five years. So that's not the question we gave them the last, you know, gallon of water we had. It was, this is temporary. Hey, we've got water you can use temporarily. Go ahead. But now we've kind of, you know, we're, we're going to be in year nine with those three additional year extensions. Okay. So a decade of temporary is putting, as you know, with growth and development, you never can tell when it takes off and when it doesn't. Gotcha. And you. so we're just kind of um, and that actually brings me really to that last bullet. This isn't just about airway heights in terms of how we got here. You know, that, that tank we intended to have uh, well out of the ground, you know, months ago, but we ran into things that we couldn't control with FAA processes, obviously with getting slowed down with pandemics, you know, the expedited growth. There has been expedited growth in the West Plains and talking with Todd Coleman, you know, when I talked to him five years ago or four years ago, you know, we had a 10 year plan and we were looking at our water, you know, sources and, you know, Airway Heights wasn't going to be here for 10 years. You know, those kind of conversations we're having were, were had, um, but, but all of those things have compounded to where we're at. So we have a temporary window that we will need very uh, focused on what water we've approved so far and what water is being requested. And again, it's not a no, it's a win. And that win will be tagged to the operational facility of that tank number three. And depending on what kind of request, uh, I have no idea what you know, Mr. Coleman and everyone else is looking at, but a very high user, like a water uh, um, um, uh, processing plant of some sort, it would be using a, a ton of water. Uh, we would tell them after the tank period in terms of uh, a very high, high significant water uh, use um, kind of a conversation. So just to give you an idea what we're you know, looking at in terms of people that have just come in the door, we do not have permits signed off on, we do not have final approvals on. Those are the kind of questions we're, we're asking. Questions, go ahead. So has Airway Heights contributed to the planning process? I know there's been a, always a financial weight of this planning going forward, which has been happening on the city side. Has Airway Heights financially participated in some of this planning growth? So, so have they come to the table? Sure, so we are asking them to come to the table with this addendum. So one of the conditions to extend for three more additional years, we're asking for approximately 65, 85, 85 excuse me, $85,000 mm -hmm. uh, to participate in our, in our study. This is over a $600,000 study we have going on. We wanna make sure that we fully understand their needs and have all the capacity to analyze, again, every potential scenario. It's not a simplistic uh, uh, question that they're trying to answer for themselves. And so we wanna make sure that we have plenty of ability to, to really do those if-then scenarios. Anybody else? Okay. So we did actually have a conversation with Airway Heights uh, a little bit. We, we shared a little bit more in depth with them uh, before meeting with you so they can understand uh, some of the background and the due diligence we've done in analyzing our, our system again today and what we have uh, uh, coming out over the next two years that we already know are, is, is in process. Um, we threw out ideas about, um, uh, you know, their, their, their crunch is in the summertime. They, they are able to turn on their, their filtered pump in the summertime, which means they're probably servicing a lot of watering going on in, in terms of lawn watering. That could be a capacity that they would want to maybe consider bringing back in and reallocating that towards development. That would require them to then um, um, put the insulation into their well station so they could run it. 24-7 throughout the year. Uh, that would give them more capacity for the capacity they already have to help them get, uh, um, span that gap again until our tank is operational. And um, they certainly have uh, the ability to put in some more storage for their peak. Well, they uh, indicated they have plenty of storage. We, we, we still think that there's probably some conversations around the peak because uh, that's when they obviously are looking for some more water for us from us. 
and if they had that capacity to hold that amount uh, during those peak times to, to be able to give out. So that is all I have for a presentation. Any final questions for Kat? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, we have a 2024 uh, estimated completion date for that tank do we know when in 2024 is it early or late you know the good news is it's just coming out of the ground which means any uh subsurface issues we've already discovered mm -hmm. and so our timing is is not being slowed down from a subsurface issue if you could tell me if materials are going to be delivered on time and labor forces will maintain to the level they mm -hmm. are on time then i can tell you the answer uh, for 2024. Okay. so right now no until we get a little bit more of that construction underway okay. we can be able to report out a little bit better all right and um, in all the suggestions that we've made, I think we talked to Albert about if they would be open to, open to helping pay for the infrastructure, and it seemed as if they were open to it. And so what is the level that we're asking them? You said that they use 36 to 37 percent. Are we basically just going to say pay 37 percent of the cost? Is that, is well, that our Well, we actually have a really good opportunity this fall uh, for some loan potential uh, that we would like to. Uh, they are potentially forgivable loans, but we need every Heights participation and support. If it's a, as a forgivable loan, obviously it saves everybody uh, okay. the, uh, the, the cost, but we are open to financially up to support. So we are keeping that very, very wide open. And um, I think they said that they're building another well in the county. Is that correct? They're building another one somewhere? Um, the, the information that they've shared through their SEPA process is a, as a, a new well potential in the uh, Rathroom Aquifer, which is the same aquifer that the city of Spokane pulls out of as well. Yes. So location-wise, it's due north of, of their city. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably is in the actual county. Okay. Um, and then lastly, how long do we foresee them actually needing those 1,400 gallons from us? No, we're still in conversation with them. Again, they're, they, uh, they're, they're working through a lot of difficult, complex issues. Um, we certainly did the right thing when, when, when they first were discovered for water, and we'll still, I believe, continue, clearly, uh, to be uh, a good partner on, the, mm -hmm. on their emergency 1,400 gallons per minute. And as we can, as a community, um, we certainly will be open to the continuing that conversation with them. All right. Go ahead. Last, last question I have, and this really isn't for Catherine, maybe, I don't know if... Eric's on or somebody, but I'm just wondering to what extent are we engaging our federal lobbyists to try and do cost recovery since this is kind of specific to an incident at Fairchild. I'm wondering how, how aggressive we are in trying to get some kind of funding from either Congress or HHS or HUD. I'm not sure who would necessarily be the specific entity, but is that ongoing? Are we having those conversations? Are we working with Airway Heights to lobby on that? What, what, what's going on there? You have some pieces yeah. of it. Um, so we haven't for our needs at this point because, um, as Catherine pointed out, initially this was really seen as a, as a short-term temporary bridge. So we haven't done that. Of course, Airway Heights has gotten a lot of commitment from the federal government for their proposed ultimate solution. They've gathered in the neighborhood of $20 million um, through a variety of, of state and federal um, funding sources. So, um, you, you know, it's those kinds of things that can help us get to that booster station and other facilities that might be needed you know it, it, this is still a long-term thing uh, building a well it, i mean we, we've been working the havana well for five years and we knew where it was going and we had funding for it and it wasn't getting a permit in another aquifer so so there's so there's some things there i mean this you know we don't know the timeline and i don't know that airway heights can really specifically tell us the timeline so this might be something too i, I agree with you we can talk to eric polson and see if there's some options also um the forgivable loan is a great option for um for pfos pfoa if we're able to get that but there could be other options the kalispell tribe also has um, interests here they're served by airway heights and may have access to dollars that um that we don't have access to as a sovereign nation so um, there are some options there to get some funding and to continue to look at what the long-term costs are going to be okay thank you anything else catherine thank you been very thorough and helpful appreciate it you betcha. So we're obviously looking for Airway Heights to give us their draft uh, response to our conditions that you saw up on the board. And we are looking for a June uh, approval. So today's uh, presentation is really that first step and first touch to get to council next month. And so I would recommend if anybody has questions, additional questions or um, suggestions to contact Catherine and or Marlene. Sorry, one last question. Do we have any inkling of when they'll be done with that? Um, with their needs assessment and submitted to us? 
um, in terms of the modeling that we're talking about? In terms of what their needs are. Um, they, we hides? I'm, I'm not sure in terms of they need to uh, agree to our, our request for, for funding and go mm -hmm. through that process. And then obviously in that process, they would articulate kind of those if then statements, what would they like to re, uh, model in terms of the scenarios. They have voiced some of them to us, but it, you know, it hasn't been formal. It's just definitely been in conversation. So are we gonna need to know that before we approve this in June? You know, again, I don't think we do in the sense that if they're willing to give us the dollars we need, we certainly will be off and running with the signing of that contract. But I would say that you want as much information as possible about that to help you make an informed decision. Council Member? And my question was going to be, so their response to us, are we would still be in the negotiation phase? Because they may respond to us that's not what we would consider favorable. And so you got us in that June timeline. In that window, there's opportunity for that if there's uh, some disagreements or some other amendments that could be added to this contract for the extension piece. So I just, I just feel 30 days feels tight if we're not all on the same page. I, I agree. We, we certainly got those comments out a, a, little, bit, a little bit ago, so we, mm -hmm. we were expecting pretty Im imminently to hear from them. Okay. Uh, on their response to that, and then we'll be able to ascertain how cl far close we are to the, the conversation. All right, thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you for thank your time. You. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Marlene, you're next with uh, support for utility customers. And, and just to Council Member Wilkerson, mm -hmm. theoretically, we could just do the one year extension if we got real, real hung up and then do the three year amendment with the conditions. If in following if if something got tangled, okay. you know, so that we would still be able to continue to provide them with the water they're receiving right. currently. Um, and so we so there is a little bit of a window there if something gets right. sideways. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to bring you up to speed as you know that we've been working with customers um, about their past due utility accounts as a result of the pandemic. So we, we remain um, in multi-million dollars of past due accounts. Um, the state um, is part of their supplemental budget included $100 million for utility support. Um, and so, uh, and that's for all kinds of utilities. So our kinds of utilities, water, wastewater, garbage, but also for um, a Vista type utilities of, for energy, um, electricity, and natural gas. So this week, we're going to make an initial application to the state to be able to be eligible for some of that funding. Mm -hmm. um, there's some specific parameters around it. Um, the, the amounts had to be um, uh, are for, from a certain time period, from March mm -hmm. of 2020, to um, December of 2021. And also the customers who are eligible to receive um, funding through this program had to have received um, funding from a number of programs um, over the pandemic period. So an, a utility um, supported program like our U Help program, also from the, the additional um, money that Congress set up, um, it's LIWAP, or and I might be pronouncing the acronym wrong, but that was specifically help for water, wastewater utilities. And also from LIHEAP, that's the project shares of the world. We've been working with Avista so that we can identify more customers. There was considerably more funding available to help power um, utility customers, energy utility customers during the pandemic period. So, so we're working so that we can just share some real basic level data so that we can get more of our customers to be considered for this funding. So um, we are submitting that and then we have to follow up with requests from Commerce uh, in June. And then ultimately, if we are selected to get some funding, we'll um, put that onto customers' accounts, and we have to do that by the end of the year, and then report back to Commerce Staff how many um, customers we're able to help. So, this is part of our ongoing uh, efforts to <laughs> uncover all kinds of funding sources that we can. Um, uh, the new rental assistance, for example, also allows for utility payments. So, those things are adding up slowly, uh, but not uh, real quickly. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Do we know uh, approximately, or or have a, a an idea of approximately how much we would be getting from this? To what percentage it would cover? We don't at this point. It's a hundred million dollars for the entire state. Mm -hmm. So if you looked at all of our outstanding balances just for residential customers, we're at about five point nine million during the period um, that's specified in the legislation. We're at about four and a half million dollars for residential customers. It's not for commercial accounts. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, whether we get all of that or not really depends on how else um, others in the state have fared. We, they are taking into consideration 
um, income levels and other data from our area as part of that analysis. And they're doing that themselves, Commerce is, so that they have apples to apples comparisons. And if, if we don't get 100% to cover all those costs, how, how will we apply that? Will we do full uh, coverage for, for people until we run out, or will we only apply a percentage of to each person's account? You know, I think we have to see what we get back, what we can qualify, so that four and a half million is at this point, we wouldn't be able to qualify all of those people because they did not receive funding mm -hmm. through those specific programs. Okay. So we're, we're, we haven't actually finalized the number of what we think we can qualify for. So it would be to those specific customers. And if, if Commerce gives us some percentage of that, we probably would do it evenly across the board rather than making determinations that customer A is more deserving than customer B because mm -hmm. we don't have that level of detail. Okay. So, Go ahead. Uh, with that... As with other funding, is that restricted to the city of Spokane limits or to our water service area? It's to our customer base, so we as a utility. Mm -hmm. As a utility, okay. yes. If we weren't able to get all of that 5.9 mm -hmm. covered, what would be a realistic pathway forward for us with people who are pretty behind on their utility payments. Right. So th thanks for that, Councilmember Bingle. So we have applied for ARP uh, dollars. We haven't settled on an amount and it hasn't really worked its way through um, the council process yet. But um, I think we're going to try and tick away as much as we can through other opportunities like mm -hmm. this one and then um, try to settle in on, on what we might need to help um, customers get through the rest. And we did speak about this. Excuse me. I did say it, sponsor whatever you need. Yeah, yeah, so, and I, I did get another, I think we have a new person who, who did respond again to me. So it, it's in the queue and, and we can probably settle on more easily what kind of dollar amount we're talking about in terms of, of help, helping to support customers. Um, because really, you know, we want everyone to be um, able to be in a position to be a good pair going forward. Um, they now have, in many cases, amounts that are, are quite weighty um, mm -hmm. on those family finances. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you. Mr. Sapone, you're going to be doing the community crosswalk resolution. Yeah, I have some slides, so I, I can just go down there. Mm -hmm. We've got it. Nicolette's got uh, it. Okay. I was like, I don't know how to do it. Just say next. The slides behind me that I can't see. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I put together uh, this proposal to create a community crosswalk pilot program. Uh, in coordination with our street mural program at the same time. And I don't know, I have, I have other slides in front of me. So you go to the next one. Thanks, Nicolette. Uh, just an overview, again, this would be a three-year project of up to $300,000. Uh, this is looking at costs based mostly out of Seattle. They do an estimate of $25 per square foot for them, um, and depending on the size of our crosswalks. And... Um, the complications and traffic or other mitigation strategies. Uh, it could be anywhere between thirty to fifty thousand dollars a crosswalk, but it's likely not done. Uh, this program would be for three years and would be about two crosswalks per district. Um, if we get cheap and get lucky, maybe more. Uh, the primary purpose of this is to be a traffic calming measure. I'll talk a little bit more about the research around. Uh, decorative community crosswalks and why they are better at traffic calming. Uh, but it would also add character to our community and showcase the different diversity in um, identities in our community and get people out on the street and uh, also attract them to our neighborhoods too. You can go next, Nicola. Thanks. So a uh, question of legality, can we paint our crosswalks? The answer is yes. Uh, according to SMC, the design of marked crosswalks on arterial streets shall be in guidance with... Um, the Federal Highway Administration Best Practices, NACTO, or other national recognized guidelines. And NACTO uh, recommends the use of decorative crosswalks to help define the pedestrian space and discourage vehicles from encroaching upon the pedestrian crossing area. And you can go to the next one. So like we said, NACTO recommends it as a traffic calming measure. Bloomberg Philanthropies just released a study last month, or March or April now, of um, a case study across the country of, I think it was 17, 18 cities that implemented decorative crosswalks and other asphalt art in their neighborhoods and saw a decrease in uh, traffic and fatalities and safety measures. 
So there was a 50% decrease in the rate of crashes, 37% decrease in engineer causing crashes, and 27% increase to drivers immediately yielding to pedestrians. Um, so part of that is people are coming out to use the crosswalks and take pictures with them and be around, and uh, cars are noticing them more and getting used to it too. So you can go to the next one. Thanks, I touched on the funding already of how much this would cost. You go to the next one. And uh, talking about this is a resolution in an SBO to include the funding and to create a program. But um, neighborhood councils, schools, community centers could all apply for this, so it would be community driven. Uh, they would work with the, uh, be develop, there would be guidelines created by the Public Works Department about what that would look like, and we've been talking to Marlene about it. Uh, and then it would be uh, administered by Spokane Arts to actually do the painting of the project. And then it would have to be signed off by a traffic engineer to make sure that it's compliant with everything for the safety. You can go to the next one. So this is just uh, the program guidelines that Seattle created, and I'd imagine ours would be pretty similar since um, a lot of the same pedestrian regulations here. And so you, I'll send it out as an email too, just so you can have it. But it would have to be at a marked, an already existing marked crosswalk where traffic would have to stop or a race crosswalk. Um, it would have to be, uh, have a, a public benefit. It couldn't be just for like a business adopting a crosswalk with their logo on it, but it's really about the community and having that outreach. Uh, the community would have to do some extensive outreach on social media, and engaging sign off by property owners, adjacent property owners, neighborhood councils, business districts, and stuff like that. Um, and then this is to go to my favorite question, which is, do other cities use it? <laughs> and the answer is yes, a lot of cities use them. Um, so uh, the, just all over the country, we see a lot of decorative crosswalks, uh, if any of you have ever walked on them. But Austin, Baltimore, Chattanooga, Detroit, Long Beach, Mc Milwaukee, San Francisco, Seattle, and many more um, use decorative crosswalks. And so uh, this Resolutions calling for just creating the pilot program on that. Um, I would have been engaging with a group of uh, LGBTQ um, organizers and a coalition of LGBTQ groups that have been uh, talking to me for a long time about a need for this in our community that they say uh, we're behind. And so just a little history on that. Uh, I, would, I would like to add to this resolution saying that the first one should be a uh, rainbow crosswalk in honor of Pride Month because we'd be passing this hopefully in June. And uh, the rainbow crosswalks have been around since the late 2000s. And the first one was in West Hollywood in 2012. In the US, they actually started abroad before coming to the US. 20, as of 2018, there were over 20 cities with rainbow crosswalks. And they're big and small cities like Seattle, San Diego, even Ames, Iowa, and Bozeman, Montana have rainbow crosswalks. So I think this would be a great symbol to our LGBT community that we stand with them in solidarity. It's something that communities across the country are doing. And it's really been driven by this community in our here locally who hasn't been seen and wants to uh, be uh, seen and, and felt included in their in our community. So with that, I can take any questions. Go ahead, Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, so we, we haven't yet implemented the street mural program that is specifically for traffic calming yet. So why jump to doing another when we haven't seen the effects of that yet? It's really doing them both together. So the street, the street murals is really focused more on residential areas, where this is more on the crosswalks. And so okay. I see them as complementary for each other. And then um, who will be deciding what happens and where? Yep, that would be policy set up by the Public Works Department. So they'll so create they're the guidelines. decide or they'll do outreach or they'll... So the communities will apply for a program and then they'll ultimately have to get the sign off from the community neighborhood council, from the other entities before anything So if there's there. six different crosswalks that people want to do in, in District 1, who will make the decision as to which gets done and which design gets accepted? No, uh, right now it would be Public Works. Okay. But, and the traffic engineer in the process there. Yeah. So basically, it's a city. The city will decide effectively for the neighborhoods. No, the neighborhoods have to apply, and then. But the city is the one who will decide which to accept. Right. It, yeah. I mean, there are crosswalks. Yeah. And they'd probably get help through the Spokane Arts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Arlene, do you Wilkerson? have any notes on that? <laughs> We're working on them <laughs> on the details. Councilmember Wilkerson, did you have a? Well, I was going to say no, no, no. You're fine. I was going to say. I had, uh, this had been brought to me when I first came on council because neighborhoods were looking for a way to identify gateways 
since they weren't kind of getting signage and it was a unique opportunity. And I guess it had been done once in our history at some point. Um, so I was excited to see it come forward and it is a pilot and it would really generate um, conversation. You gotta have six and get down to three there would be some conversations going on somewhere. So Marlene, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't think we want to be, Public Works doesn't want to be in the position oh, yeah. of approving artwork. I, I think we can approve um, that it complies with making sure that, that the mm -hmm. appropriate, you know, bumper striping is happening and things like that to that. But but I think Spokane Arts would probably mm -hmm. be in a better position or you could set up a committee to determine, mm -hmm. you know, if there's competing um, applications. I think it would be awkward for um, folks who, uh, Clean and clean, clean streets and fill potholes to make those decisions. So, um, we're happy to make sure that they comply with the engineering st standards that might be. We're happy to, you know, set up some policies, but think it should probably be more of a, um, a community-driven uh, selection yeah. process. Go ahead. So then, who would who would make up the committee from from Spokane Arts? Do we do we know that? And how would they? We can get, we can get more information on that. Okay. Because yeah. I'd just be curious to know their, their uh, criteria for, for approval, um, just because I think you can get into a lot of hot water with a lot of different groups with competing interests and you know, maybe even competing ideologies in many ways. I, mean, I think a lot of the, you have to meet certain criteria, right. right? So a lot of, if you're not getting the community support, the application won't ever rise to the top. Who determines the level of community support that would be acceptable? Well, well I, th I think that's following these guidelines that we see in Seattle because mm -hmm. they would have similar thing where there's a lot of people that want crosswalks. So it's about like you have to do these requirements of community outreach, building up the program, stuff like that. And that's why we're going to set up more about allowing that to, to be developed. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, just wondering on the standard. So street murals, I think you can have some some language, some words as part of the mural. But for a sidewalk or a crosswalk, I assume you would not be allowed to, to have words as part of a crosswalk. Would that be, or is that permitted? Because where I'm, where I'm going is, you know, we have a rule right now under the street mural program that I think it's 100% of the adjacent residents have to approve of the mural. In this case, it sounds like that might not be the case, but if there's gonna be words or language that somebody either disagrees with or finds offensive or whatever, will yeah. there be an opportunity Inga's for an objection? Inga's telling me no, we wouldn't allow words in the crosswalk. Probably okay. for, that makes even it easier. for traffic yeah. distraction purposes. Right. We don't yeah. want people trying to read you know, artistically designed words while the they're going plowing okay. over a pedestrian yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we try not to do that or something that says go <laughs> do you have a co-sponsor and i do not yet do you want a co-sponsor i would love a co-sponsor who wants to co-sponsor oh you've got two All right. um i just had one clarification oh sorry um i just i heard from shauna harshman that we do have a process document for the street murals, right. and so yes. it would be it would be very it's adapted but, yeah. to this. But. I was like, it's going to be building on that process that Shauna has been working on for a long time. Right. Anything else? Councilmember Kinnear, can I just clarify the sponsorships for the resolution and the SBO that was sent around earlier we today? We have that... Councilmember Wilkerson okay. and Councilmember Stratton. So you're really popular. That's great. Okay. But we expect our pictures to be on one of those murals. It Good luck. Be you as Lilac Queen. <laughs> it better be. Big crown. Yeah. I, I would like mine on a wall instead of a crosswalk. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. Okay. I don't want people walking on me. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, we have an SBO for SPD Emphasis Patrol along North Division Corridor. That's mine. And uh, Assistant Chief Lundgren, are you online? Are you on virtual? Maybe. Council Member Kinnear, yes, I'm here. That's special. Thank you. So. Just a little bit of background. Council or um, Captain Meidel came to me and said that there was an issue, North Division, people racing. I'm pretty sure it was, it was you, wasn't it? Uh huh. So, racing up and down North Division, they were congregating in some of the parking lots there, and it was a real issue. It, it's heard all the way up and down the corridor. So. It was a safety issue. It was a noise issue. Um, there was, there were crimes being committed in the parking lots, and so as we're going forward, I said, "What do you need?" She said, "We need overtime, so that we can monitor that and take care of it." So here we are to approve overtime 
for that particular emphasis, it would be through the summer to make sure, because that's when people like, they have nothing else to do, so they're gonna race. We also talked about separately um, emphasis patrols in our neighborhoods, um, specifically for District 3, it was Monroe. Yeah, North Monroe's been a big issue, Northwest Boulevard, um, those are the two that come to mind. Okay, so this is the first step to vote on this piece. Then separately, council members in each of the districts need to identify the hot spots so that we can give those to the, emphasis, to the police to have emphasis patrols in those areas as well. But that would be a separate issue. I didn't want you to think that we'd forgotten about that piece. Go ahead. And so, Council President, is this what we were talking about in, in our 11 o'clock of transferring money from the traffic calming measures to fund this overtime? Yes. We talked about broader, also schools and parks, right, but right. this is what I was mentioning. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I am one of the sponsors. I will need another. Okay. Sponsor, yeah. So uh, Mr. Bingle will be the other sponsor, Hannah Lee. And Council President, did you have anything to add to this? Just, I, I mentioned to some people at a, a meeting some of us were at earlier today that I did have a, a successful meeting with uh, the chief of police and uh, other leaders from Spokane Police and Johnny Perkins. Uh, sounds like affirming a very similar concept for the schools and parks effort that we've been trying to get done for a few years. It sounds like we're moving ahead on that as well. Great, super. Any questions from council? Okay, so that should be coming forward very quickly. If you have, again, if you have additional questions or concerns, please let me know and we can tinker with it a little bit to make it palatable for everyone. All right, anything else for the good of the order? Okay, uh, we are adjourned. It's 227. We'll see you back here at 330.